You're listening to Consolidate That. Ukraine is my motherland. It is now under a savage attack by Russia. Ukraine is shielding Europe and the rest of the civilized world from Putin's barbaric aggression. Ukrainians are brave and effectively fighting back. Let's help. Make a donation to Armed Forces of Ukraine. Link is in the show notes. Hashtag stand with Ukraine. Welcome back to Consolidate That, Ivan. It's great to see you again. Hope everything has been going well for you. I'm excited to have all of my bosses on our podcast today. Um, so I'm going to introduce <laughs> Christine and we can kick everything off. <laughs> okay. It's a good intro. Uh, intimidating. Uh, yeah. I'm very excited today about our guest. Uh, so we have Christine Stump. She is our Vice President of Merge and Acquisitions. A little bit about her. So Christine has extensive leadership and analytical experience in executive management, including mergers and acquisitions, negotiations, marketing, sales, strategic planning, corporate valuations, financial planning and analysis, treasury and cash management, capital projects, risk and insurance management. Over 15 years with EMA Partners, a boutique M&A firm doing primarily sell-side transactions in a variety of industries, 10 years in pharma biotech industry as a finance leader with Amgen and Immunex. Christine is an experienced treasurer and executive member on board of directors, multiple nonprofit organizations. She has BA degree in finance from Honors College at Washington State University with study abroad certificates from University of Copenhagen, Denmark, and Kharkiv Agricultural Institute, Ukraine, yes. MBA from Pacific Lutheran University. Are you kidding me? I had no idea. We're going to start right there. Christine, <laughs> welcome to the show. Thank you for finding the time. You were in Kharkiv Agricultural Institute. Yes, I spent a summer there back in the 90s. Yes. Why you never told us about this? Like, no, I don't think anybody knows about this. I knew, you know I that knew that's my hometown. Yeah. But that's my hometown. Like, that's where I was born. And... I know, I'm excited. That's that so interesting. Oh, we have more conversations to have about this. But, <laughs> but for the interest of this podcast, uh, Christine, that is an incredible incredible, rich experience. And what you're bringing to our m and team is so valuable. But I want to start with just basically, what was the path? And how do you select the path on which you sort of landed where you at today? And, uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, this is, uh, this is an interesting background with so many accomplishments. So where did you start? When was what was the dream when you were like, okay, I want to be this? <laughs> Well, you know, when I started my um, path back in college, I really thought that I was going to go international business, which is why you saw I had a couple of opportunities to do that. And I still love to travel. I love international business, but I, I went down the path more towards the finance side of it. And, you know, I think as you saw there, I started my career out kind of being more of a, an analyst and I was kind of a data jockey. I spent a lot of time learning programming languages back in the early days. And what I learned then was how numbers can tell a story. And I found that it was really interesting for me to be able to take that information and portray it to people in a way that they can understand it. And so as we walk through today's discussion, I'll be kind of weaving that story theme through here because my entire life I've enjoyed telling stories and I like to do it through numbers which is my background. Yeah. All right. That's very interesting. Well, so what kind of stories we can tell about the veterinary sellers? And, and I know that your background was more on the seller side, which is one uh -huh. of the most exciting things in your career that, that attracted us that we, by, because we're so much a people organization and we, we partner rather than acquire hospitals. So we want to know how does it feel on their side? Mm -hmm. So, looking at the numbers mostly before you meet them in person because that's that's what we do we first look at the numbers how do then numbers connect with the story of the person behind and how do you see that in the day-to-day -day sort of m a work when i was working on the side of a cell side it was kind of going beyond just the numbers but to understanding kind of the history of the person how did they come into what they're trying to do helping to help those sellers kind of tell what what was their background and why are they passionate about what they're doing and kind of helping them 
to portray that to the buyers. And the numbers piece of it does feed into it because you have historical trends, you have data that comes through that that helps them to portray either they're like on a phenomenal ride and they're going to go up or there might be some questionable things that have happened and you need to be able to explain that. And usually there's some reason behind that and helping them to kind of explain that has been what I've done in the past. So what do you think are, are some big ways that sellers can prepare that story? You know, we have a list mm -hmm. of the financials that we request from them, but what are things that maybe aren't in the standard list of, of questions that or things that people could add as color to be able to tell those stories through the numbers? Usually I want to, I want to know their staffing, kind of who who are the people that they've got? What are their ratios of who, how many DVMs they have to how many other staff they've got and kind of how that's changed over time? You know, I want to be able to understand kind of who are their strong players that are like producing significantly for them, you know, so that we can help to encourage those folks into doing even more. Like what, what can we help them to do to do their job better? Um, so kind of helping to understand the pieces of their business and helping them to kind of know who who knows their information. Maybe there's somebody on their team that's better at portraying the, the information, who's very organized. And so who are those people that we can talk to that might be able to get that information that we need from them? One uh, interesting thing that I observed through, you know, several deals that, that we approached that you're the most gentle interrogator I ever met in my life. So you can point out things from the data and from the financials that are sort of fishy, if you will. And then we were able to actually opt out of, um, well, at least one deal that I remember where you could see by the numbers that the story doesn't fit the numbers. So what are the particular things you're looking for in that sort of, it's almost like you're assessing the culture looking at the financial picture, which was great, you know, with that particular practice that we looked at. So what are those things that the sellers can do if we have sellers listening to this podcast? What can they do so the number picture fits with their story, if you will, mm -hmm. and not make up the story along the way? You know how sellers want to sort of show their their high revenue, low EBITDA, but then you can really tell with it. So what are the mistakes that the sellers can do by just driving numbers as their CPAs may advise them? I think there's a lot of things that, that sellers should do before they prepare for a sale. And that is kind of understanding their business. And sometimes it's, it's not an area that they're going to be an expert in, but you know, how do they look at their inventory and kind of knowing what's going into their cost of sales? And is there some unusual things that may have happened that caused it to be high? Maybe they went out and bid, did a big bulk purchase because they got a discount on that and being able to explain that to a buyer you know, hey, we, we had a high cost of sales over the last couple of months because we did buy something in advance. And so being able to, to understand their own information and be able to explain what might be some unusual things that have happened in those numbers. So with, with that sort of, we, you said what they should do, what they should not do. So then someone like <laughs> yourself looking on the other side and saying, this doesn't add up. Yeah. Um, well, you know, certainly not being aware of what's going on in their own business is a problem. You know, if you start to ask questions and they don't know any of the answers, you know, maybe they, they need to put us together with another team member that can answer that. And it might mean that they're expanding the group that knows what's going on in the transaction, but it helps to tell the, tell the story and to understand that story. So if, if they can partner with the right people that can help them with that, that might be a helpful thing to do. Um, but certainly not having good advice is, is a big problem for somebody. So we've had experience in the past where there's been some sellers that haven't had the best counsel, for example, they might be, uh, in sure a very <laughs> disadvantaged position going into due diligence because that advice might not be getting them the information that they need to be able to do to help sell their business in the best possible way. So what other advisors do you think that the owner should partner with and, and invest into, uh, not only financially, but also relationship wise and, and commit the time uh, in order to have a successful transaction? And, uh, and when you're saying that proper legal advice, 
does that mean their uncle who does the uh, marriage <laughs> counseling and divorce? <laughs> like what, what is the proper counsel that should be guiding these things for the seller? Usually you're, you're going to want to make sure that they have good legal counsel that's experienced in M&A transactions. And, you know, certainly we've had a number of different parties that we've talked to that might have, like you mentioned, the friend or somebody that's kind of experienced in legal, but maybe on more of a kind of trial basis, maybe they, they go to court and, you know, do that side of law, but not necessarily the side of law that is supporting M&A transactions. So having somebody that's got that level of expertise to walk them through the process is critical. I'd say having some good um, accounting or financial background between, you know, maybe your own in-house who you use as accounting, but maybe if there's a third party vendor that you could use to help make sure that your data is is good and being able to tell the story and the information that you've got, that would be very helpful. Um, and sometimes it's useful to use a broker and there are certainly plenty of them out there. I was a part of one for 14 years and we helped companies prepare for that phase of when they wanna go out to sell. Um, so that's another advisor that they could use. You know, so I, I opened by saying I have all my bosses here. I did forget RJ, who's our CFO, but um, I think once sellers sign a letter of intent with me, then mm -hmm. they move into more so your world, which um, is a part of the process that you really lead and, and take full ownership of, which is that due diligence process. Yeah. What do you think people should prepare themselves for mentally, time-wise, impact-wise? Um, we were talking the other day on, for a single doctor practice of what sort of impact they should expect to see on their their actual production um, mm -hmm. while they're going through this. What do you think people should mentally prepare themselves for during the due diligence process? Sure, due diligence is a lot of work for a seller. And so if they have somebody on their team that's able to help them, um, that can help ease the burden. But that first couple of weeks to a month is gonna be a deep dive into providing a lot of documents. So generally, most firms will have a data room that they'll call that, that you're going to put all of this data into. And so it's collecting information, making sure that it's kind of explained well and being able to be um, put into the right buckets. Um, so you're going to be asked uh, to go and, and dig up data for the last couple of years at a very excruciating detailed level. So having somebody to help you with that or be prepared to mentally have to know that you're going to spend a lot of time on that. And then you go from that phase, which is what we call the data collection phase, into the next phase, which we call data analysis. And that's the time when once we have all of that data collected, we are going in as a team here at the Galaxy Vets side to analyze all of this information that's been provided. And during that time, we're going to come up with a lot of questions. So I generally set up kind of a weekly meeting with our sellers and we try to, you know, bring in different people within the organization that have analyzed the information that we've collected. And then we're going to be talking through it with those sellers. So that's going to be another couple of weeks to a month period of time that you're going to be spending a lot of time answering a lot of questions. And from there, we go into a phase that I call kind of the the final preparation. And it's when you sit down with the legal teams and you have your initial phases of a document that's called the asset purchase agreement, or maybe it's a, a different, maybe it's a stock purchase agreement, but any type of purchase agreement that you're going to have a draft that you're going to start negotiating back and forth. You're going to have a lot of negotiations around all of the employment contracts. You're going to have negotiations that are going to happen around um, any leasing or anything around the property or any potential vendors that are going to have to have a transition plan with. So this negotiation phase can take anywhere from a month to two months. Could be faster, but it just depends on how, how close you are towards having uh, an agreement on those terms. And I think the role that you take, Ryan, in preparing those sellers to going into an LOI so that they know kind of what they're getting into can make that whole process go a lot smoother. So, so that's an, that's an incredible description of the process. So thank you for that. And then how would you help Ryan and I, when we go talk to clinics and, and inspire them, we're selling them on the vision. So they're all excited about it. Then we're agreeing on the numbers preliminary before we have this. 
what would you, uh, I, I'm wondering if you could give us the talk track, like how do we describe to people the actual process of due diligence? Because I remember I went through it only once myself on the seller side when we sold uh, SmartFlow and it wasn't a pleasant process at all. <laughs> None of it is feels great. And, and so so how would you help us to describe this to the owner? Because we're kind of the pumping them into this kind of exciting phase of their life because they're exiting their business, they're joining us as a partner, and then they're gonna go into this sort of a I shouldn't call it a low, but like it's a you know, it's it's a, it's a procedure <laughs> that you don't, you know, that yeah. you dread. So, um, so how would you describe it? So we're, we're enough descriptive, but not scaring the, the partner, the future partner to join us. I think just what you kind of, we're starting to go down the path. It's an intense period of time. Just be prepared for that. Know that it's going to be a couple months of just really spending some, some deep uh, time in getting information gathered to answering questions, to, helping another party understand your story and just know that this is part of your story. You're, you're describing your business and it's probably the biggest transaction you will have in your life and you want to do this well. And to make sure that this transition goes well for your team and the rest of the people that are involved, you want to make sure that it's a good fit both ways. So not only am I trying to gather information from you, you're trying to gather information from us. The final dotted line when you sign is when it all comes to a close. But before that, you know, through that process, you want to know what are you getting into? And so make sure you're prepared to have questions, you know, dig deep into understanding what this new business is going to look like and prepare yourself for what that transaction is going to or the transition time is going to look like after acquisition is done. So what are those good questions? What the seller can ask and say, you know, during this due diligence process, because it does feel like you're interrogated, but then also what are those useful things that the seller can ask the, the group or the console leader in this process to be successful and, and be prepared for it? Well, I think they need to understand what is their role going to be within this new organization and, and what kind of expectations there will be on what they're going to be doing. And the team members, for each one of the people on their team, what is their new work life going to look like? And how does this transition plan look like it's going to impact their, their future? So understanding each of those pieces of the business and what it's going to look like going forward is important for them to know before they close as well. And the cultural fit, you know, it, is this aligned with what your own personal goals are? Do you, do you see that, uh, you know, this is an environment where you feel like you can, you can contribute and be successful in what you're doing? So um, what are the things that can uh, delay the process? Because it's, you know, everybody who finally signed the LOI, you feel like you sold your business, but that's just the beginning. And as you said, that process, you know, can take, what, what are the ranges of the process for the vet clinic in particular? And what are the factors that will delay things? And what are sure. the factors that will accelerate things and make them more successful faster? I think, you know, during the due diligence process, one of the things that we're going to be spending a lot of time is looking at your financials. And if you're seeing during the course of due diligence, you know, financial results trending down and going negative, that can definitely slow the process because that'll, you know, raise some red flags. It's not performing to what the expectations were when you went into the LOI. So we want to make sure we know why, you know, if there's something that happened that might be um, something that's really explainable, you know, then that you know, example I gave earlier of like a one-time purchase where you made a, a big, huge group purchase of vaccines and it caused your cogs to skyrocket for a month and your financials went negative that month and, you know, being able to explain that. But if you can't explain it, then it's going to take some time to go through and, and know what might have happened. Uh, some other things that may slow it down, if you should choose to go down the path of, of partnering us to go with a 1042 exchange, like you mentioned a couple of podcasts earlier with um, Corey, like it's, it's a complicated process and understanding and negotiating through those things will cause it to delay. And, um, you know, there's, there's other relationships that a party might be involved in that, you know, we need to get to understand those relationships and they might be very complicated. And so helping us to navigate through what that 
future partnership might look like can slow things down. But, um, you know, certainly we want to move as quickly as we can through both, you know, both parties want to move through this as fast as possible. And and certainly that uncle who is the marriage counsel and also a transactional lawyer for the clinic is not a huge help in acceleration of the process, right? So someone who just knows their thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, so with the way you're describing this, and I've seen you do deals, um, the the sort of the, the final step of the m and is the transaction, the signature, it happens. But yeah. uh, what does m and process or m and final point is a positive or a negative for you? Because finishing the transaction doesn't seem like that's just a good result enough for you. What is the good transaction for you? Like, what does that look like compared to a bad one? Well, obviously... <laughs> There's negotiations through the whole process. And my my former boss used to tell me that when you get to the end of a deal, you're successful if nobody's happy. <laughs> because everybody's, That's not a good way to put it. <laughs> everybody's got to give on something. So you go into it knowing that you're going to need to negotiate through some things. And, and that was probably not always the best example, but, you know, generally just going to it, going into it, knowing that you're going to have to give and take on both sides and kind of where are you willing to, to negotiate a little bit and where are you not? That's, that's important. And, you know, both sides want to have this shared vision of what it's going to look like for the future. And if we can both come to an agreement of what that future is going to be and have an excitement and a shared enthusiasm around that, I think that is success to me. So I, I spend a lot of time trying to develop the story with my internal teams. We have an integration team here, and that group is going to be taking my little baby that I've just been growing up and taking it on and going through integration and stabilization and making sure that that team is ready and, and understands all the nuances of this is kind of a, a success for me. You know, so I work really hard to try to have a successful M&A handoff and making sure that everybody kind of understands the, where, where that is. Um, but I, I, I think, you know, having both parties really excited at close is, is, is definitely the goal. And we want to both be there and, and have a celebration. So I try to make it really fun. We used to have a ceremony kind of in my former background. Every time we closed a deal, we popped the champagne and had a little party. So for our first couple of deals here at Galaxy Vets, I've tried to have a little pseudo kind of celebration because I want to make this something that it is a time to celebrate. You know, you've made a huge decision in your life. You've gone through this huge, really painful process and let's do something to celebrate and let's make this um, momentum to, to start through with the new combined entity um, on the right foot. That's awesome. I, yeah, I agree. I, I try to do that with the signing of the LOI and I, I think we, try to continue on that excitement because this isn't the, for the way that we work with people, it's not the ending of their business. It's a start of a new chapter of their business mm -hmm. with Galaxy Vets, because we do work with, with sellers that want to continue to grow and participate with us and, and do those things for the long term. So that's, that's fantastic. I, I'm actually jumping in because I think we're coming up a bit on our time. There's a few other stories that I know that I want to hear from you but maybe we'll have to have you back and you can tell us some, uh, some old war stories from, from deals that, uh, that you've done in the past. But um, for right now, what's, I'd love to hear maybe a book or a podcast or a TED Talk recommendation, something that people can do to, that sort of helps inspire what you're doing and, and how you think about things. Sure. So I, I'm a very strong Christian. My faith is based on um, the Bible, and I do read it every day. There's so much in there that can help you with your day-to-day -day life. And so for me, that's kind of my my main thing. That's my kind of, what do I follow every day? I kind of look to that to see what I need to do. And the book of Proverbs is amazing. There's a chapter at the very end that describes kind of a woman of valor. And I look at that and I think, okay, how am I holding myself up to that? And what can I strive to be better at? Um, so that's my, you know, main thing. There's a, a television series out right now called The Chosen, and I follow that and uh, feel like that's um, really portraying the stories of the Bible. 
And so again, it's for me, it's around the stories. And I love to hear about the stories that are the disciples that follow Jesus. It's their backstories. What did their lives look like? Um, and I think, you know, I just, I have a passion for telling stories. And that's kind of one of the things that Jesus did best. Uh, wow, that's a great book recommendation. And we did, uh, we always ask this question on this podcast, as well as the other podcast that we do on innovation. And it's been collectively, I think, 250 episodes, and I'm surprised that you're the first one that recommends Bible. So, so thank you for that recommendation. Um, and then we have a specific question that I don't fully understand, but I know that this is a huge part of uh, of your storytelling. So, uh, and it is about uh, what made you start Winding Lane Memories, and how does that correlate to the M and A process? Sure. Um, back. Uh, 10 plus years ago, I had a friend of mine come to me and ask me to start a business with her telling people stories. And she was a phenomenal writer and able to interview and pull out information from people. And she wanted to start documenting people's stories. And our first book that we published was with a local man that had been diagnosed in his early 40s with ALS. And he was facing... Um, you know, a very short future. He had two small children. He was estranged from his wife and he really wanted to pass on his stories, his faith, his belief in his life to his children for their future. And so we sat down over the course of a couple of months and worked with this man to generate a book that would capture everything, his wishes and dreams and hopes for the future for his children. He poured so much time into this over the course of a couple of months. And in the end, he was barely able to even move a finger, but he spent so much time working on this and we helped him create that story. And in the end, we shared that with his children at his funeral. And it just really impacted me and how important it is that we pass on our stories and who we are. And so, you know, over the course of a year, we wrote quite a few stories and ended up not keeping on with it, but I still continue to, to feel very passionate about each one of us have a story to tell. And what is that story and what does it mean for the future? And how do we bring that to share with those that mean a lot to us? And that's my background on that. That just... Uh... Maybe a little bit emotional. <laughs> my uh, my uh, grandmother, <clears throat> uh, who passed recently, uh, she uh, in Kharkiv, uh, so she thank God she didn't see what's going on in Ukraine right now. Uh, but uh, but that's that's what we did for her. We probably didn't do it at the level that you did. But uh, she was ninety six and she lived through the Second World War, and uh, it's just uh, it was interesting to learn what was it like to be a teenager during the Second World War. And I'm sure we'll have a lot of those stories um, from Ukrainians that are going through what they're going right now. Mm -hmm. So anyway, just thank you for sharing that. Yep. We can learn a lot from our past and the, the future is there. And uh, Plato once said that uh, those who tell stories are the ones that will rule society. And so tell your stories well. That is the kind of out outcome of what I guess I would say from this. Yeah, I'm, uh, I learned a lot about that while talking to investors. They want to know not just your, your pro forma, but this story. How did you come up with the, you know, with the passion and what you do? So that certainly um, drives a lot of the things in this world. Christine, thank you so much. I've learned so much about you. I'm very excited to have you again here and uh, hear more stories. And uh, thank you for your first podcast. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm uh, privileged to have that interview with you. So, uh, so hope to see you here again on, on our uh, Consolidate That podcast. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to Consolidate That. If you want to hear our new episodes, please find us on any podcast platform. Also, you can learn more about us on our website at galaxybets.com.